so yeah, let's get started. So box plots, um, this is something that we use quite often. It's really good to um, explain a bunch of different concepts. So um, when we're talking about um, different quartiles, which is something that's been in this chapter, um, when you label a box plot, try to get, that's not the max, <laughs> try to get used to um, labeling box plots so you can um, read them and it makes sense to you. So you always have your minimum and your maximum. And then in the middle, you're gonna have your quartiles. So Q1, Q2, and Q3. Um, can anyone tell me what the uh, percentile is for Q2, maybe? Not quiz. Yes, Mary, good job. Yep, this is our 50th percentile. And that means that 50% of our data lies at or below um, this line. And another thing that is that this is, is the median. Um, so that's where we get that from. And then our, uh, this means that our Q1 is gonna be our 25th percentile. And think of it, you know, Q1 quartile, one quarter, 25, you know. Um, and then Q3 is 75, 70, 75th percentile. So that means that 75% of our data here lies at or below our Q3. Boom. So that's a box plot. Um, really good for looking at uh, a good way to summarize data um, and have it visually. And that's for our quantitative data, by the way. Um, okay, so, and then talking about outliers, basically, when we talk about outliers, there's, you know, you can obviously look at a graph and say, okay, that looks like an outlier because it's really far out or whatnot, um, but there is a way that we can find, like, more objectively find what an outlier is in a graph. Um, so, for example, here, I have, um, so it's called the IQR method, that's one way you can do it. Um, so, you're trying to make a, basically, like, an area around Q1 and Q3. And because that's going to be able to tell you if it passes this area, then that means it's going to be an outlier. Um, so you have, if you have your box plot, for example, um, remember you have Q1 here and then Q3, and you're basically trying to find a barrier, you know, that that's what you find here. You, you find the range, first of all, so you, you get your IQR, yeah. which is within this. And then basically by multiplying by 1.5, it's basically taking it out like one and a half like places. It's saying that if it's more than one and a half places out of, you know, Q1 and Q3, that's when we're going to like consider an outlier. So it's going to give you um, that amount that is or whatever, you know, it lies out here is going to be what we consider it. So it's more objective way than just looking and saying that kind of looks like an outlier. Um, so that's why we use that. Um, Okay, so our time series plot, this is a way that we can kind of show um, how things change over time. Our x-axis is always going to be time. This is definitely constant just because you're always going to have, you know, um, the earliest to um, the most recent. And, boop. and then our y-axis is going to be some sort of quantitative variable. So, um, once again, this is a way to represent quantitative variable, any sort of um, value to it. Um, so here we have estimated spending. So it's just showing that for each of these years, what the estimated spending is. And technically, you can really just, um, you can put a dot for each of these. But when you connect it, you can see the trend. So here you can, you can say, like, you know, it was decreasing moderately, then it had a sharp decline, sharp incline, and then it kind of stayed stable, you know. So that's why we connect them, because then you're able to see the change over time there. Okay. Water. All right. Okay, so then if we want to display one quantitative and one categorical, um, we are able to do that through these two different displays. So we do have our um, a box plot, side by side box plot. And our side by side box plot is what we have here. So I'll show you our um, what, what kind of variable is gender? Is that categorical or quantitative? Yes, Mary is on the ball. Good job. So this is going to be our categorical variable. Cat, meow. Yes, categorical. Um, so that's our categorical variable. And then age, obviously, then is going to be our quantitative. So this is um, basically this is the ability that we can take um, a quantitative variable. So in this case, you know, if we only had one of these, it would just be a quantitative, you know, talking about the age of an actor. So technically, if we only had one of these box plots, we'd just be talking about um, 
quantitative variables. But if we wanted to compare two categorical, we can take these two quantitative um, variables, or the, you know, these two, we take the two categorical variables and put them on in terms of their quantitative variable and then just compare them. So it's a good way to compare, you know, we can say like, oh, the medium, the medium, the median of, you know, actors is this much higher than actresses or whatnot. Um, and same with like our max and our min, we can show, you know, how the max of the actors is clearly larger than the max of the actresses and so on and so forth. So, and this is the same idea here. Um, if we, this is going to have our categorical variable actually here on, on the y axis and then um, PS, you can write this the opposite way. Like you guys see us write box plots a lot like this. You can also write side by side box plots that way. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, we have our categorical variable here, which is our supplier and then our length, um, which is our quantitative variable. And it's just showing you the, for a dot plot, you know, each, uh, each observation that you got there. And, um, and then you're able to compare them in terms of, you know, obviously like the amount of dots at each one, because like, for example, um, so right here is 50, 598.5, and that corresponds with this dot too. This dot is also 598.5, or it's, that's what it is on a quantitative, and then you just are able to see the um, frequency of it instead um, in terms of that. So you can compare the shape of these variables. You can also compare the uh, you know, frequency and whatnot. So that's where we got that. Boop, boop. Okay, and then quantitative and categorical variables continued. Um, this is in terms of the fact that you can also do it with histograms. This is very similar to when we did the um, dot plot with groups. Um, so here, our frequency, this is our quantitative variable again, and then improvement is gonna be our categorical variable. Um, and it's the same idea as a dot plot, except we use this for um, larger sample sizes because we can put you know, basically any type of like range within these, um, within the bars, you know, we don't, for dot plots, you know, if you had like a million, um, like a million observations at one of the numbers, you wouldn't want to draw a million dots, obviously. I mean, unless you have all, all the time in the world, but instead you can literally draw a, um, a bar and say, you know, this is like 1 million. So that's why this is better for um, larger sample sizes, but it's the same idea as a dot plot. Um, you can compare the shapes of them and obviously the, uh, the different, frequencies at each um, value. So, cha. I'm sorry. And let me also, location, categorical. Improve, yeah, improvement is like a nut, yeah. Choo choo. This is also, I apologize, this is also like quantitative, but you're comparing, um, yes, yeah, so this is quantitative and this is categorical. Sorry. So, yes, there we go. Because frequency is always going to be there um because you're always showing the frequency um but yeah all right boop, boop. okay so then if you have two quantitative variables you can show them on a scatter plot this is something that we use often because it can show us um trends in the data um so we have so your direction is either positive or negative so if we use this one as an example this is going to be negative because from uh you always want to make sure you're going from left to right some people struggle with that because they would you know see it the other way that's going up but you always you want to draw your line from left to right, that'll tell you. So this one's going to be negative. Um, form, is it linear or nonlinear? Does it look like a line or not? I would say this one's linear. Strength, uh, weak, moderate, strong. You can also kind of combine these. I would say this one's like, it's pretty strong. It's like moderately strong. It's kind of in the middle. Um, and then outliers, this one doesn't look like it has any, but if I had something over here or whatnot, that'd be our outlier. So that's the thing we can, um, and as you see here, we always have our explanatory variable on the x-axis, which is the independent variable, and then our response variable on the y, and that's our dependent variable. Um, so our explanatory variable explains our dependent variable, so that's why we have this on the x-axis, and then it's explaining whatever um, value you got over here. So that's why we use scatter plots for that, um, and both the explanatory variable and the response variable are going to be quantitative in that case. All right, and this is the same idea. I won't go too far in depth. Then the only difference between this scatter, scatter plot and the last one is that it has groups. So you have the, you still have the two quantitative variables. So here you have the pedal width, pedal length. So it's still two quantitative variables. But like we've been doing, if you want to add in a categorical variable, all they did here is add in different categories. So like I said, if you had one of these by themselves, it would just be you know two quantitative variables. But since in this case we added um, a categorical variable to so the different species. Um, and all you do is plot them all in the same scatter plot. It's the same, similar idea there. Okay, and correlations kind of related to this. 
um, because it's just talking about the strength and direction of uh, of your graph. So for example, we have, um, this is just showing you, and this says the absolute value of R because you don't wanna think of positive or negative as being like the value, it's, it's the direction. So positive means that it's in um, a positive direction and then negative, obviously negative direction, direction. So, um, so they're not values. That's why we say it's absolute value of R that's showing us the strength. Um, so this is going to be our strength, these numbers, and then our direction is going to be, obviously, if it's positive or negative. Um, you do have to have a linear association in order to use this or else it doesn't make sense. You know, you can't have like some parabola looking thing and then try to make a, um, or you can't like make a correlation with this because you can't, you would have to draw a line through this and this does not make sense, you know, how much these are correlated to the line because they're really weird, you know, so that's why it does have to be linear, that's important. And then it does have to have two quantitative variables, which is similar to our um, scatter plots, which is why I was saying that this is um, a similar idea there. Because remember, we talked about you can describe uh, scatter plots with strength and direction, which is basically correlation, which is where we got this from. Um, so, yeah. Let's keep cruising. So, okay, so simple linear regression. This is basically just telling us um, if you have one explanatory variable, which is why it's called simple, because it's just one variable, and then a straight line, which is where you get the linear part from. Um, so yeah, so then this is just the equation that you use for a simple linear regression in a line. Um, and make sure, you know, when you see an equation like this in stat, you should always try to draw it out and like understand where it came from um, or solve it out and whatnot. So um, if we were to write this on a, if, if we did an example, um, if I put, you know, the, the dot here, this is going to be my y-intercept because this is our y-axis. So this is b subscript zero. And then our slope is going to be whatever, you know, rise over run, if you guys remember that. So our slope is going to be whatever that is. And then y hat is our predicted value of y for any given value of x. So for example, if I was trying to find, um, like, if the x that I, I had is like 16, then my predicted y, that's what I'm trying to find. So let's say that this was 16. That means that um, my y hat would be here. It's the predicted value. So basically I'd have 16 comma y hat because that's what we're trying to solve. And then you use this equation to solve that. So that's where that comes from. Okay, residuals. Um, all this is saying is you're trying to decide basically how far your um, different values are from the how much how far like the observed value that you got is from what you would predict it to be. So anytime you have oh, the straight line, ooh, oh, because I have it on straight line. Okay, um, so let's say this is like your predicted line. All right, I need to get out of this thing. Okay, here we go. Now I can squiggle. So this is your predicted line. So predicted, and then you know these are your observations that you get. Um, and then maybe you have one here, whatever. So if you have that, then your residual is going to be the distance between your um, observed, so this is gonna be your observed, and then um, your predicted, so this is y hat. So observed is technically y. Um, so your residual is like all these pink lines that I'm drawing here. And then technically, what would the residual of this one be that's right on the line? Thinking conceptually about it. Yes, great job, Laura. Yeah, so that would be zero because if you think about it, it's showing that, you know, your observed Y value is whatever this is and then your predicted is also on the line. So there's a residual of zero. It's not any um, amount from the line. So, yeah, so like I said, all these pink lines I'm drawing, those are going to be our residuals, which is how we get it with this equation. All right. Oh, review time. Okay, so... Okay, and I'm trying something new because I found out that on here you can do a polling option and I'm trying to be high tech and cool. So we're gonna try it, we'll see if it works. But, so let's try this one. So which of the following cannot be answered from a regression equation? So I'm gonna put up launch poll. Oh, oh my God. Okay, yeah, try, see, can you guys like click on that? Like can you click on an, like an answer or something? Maybe. I hope it works, that'll be so cool. All right, yay. Okay, so try clicking these. 
and right, <laughs> try answering it and then clicking the thing. Um, and then we will review it together. Okay, yay. Thank you to our four friends who participated. <laughs> All right, so we're a little split. We are, let me end, end poll. Okay, share result. What? All right, let me, poll closed. Voting is closed. All right, I need to figure this out. Okay, whoa. All right, so let's go through this. So remember our regression equation is the one that we were trying to find out, a simple linear regression. So when you had the y hat um, equals our, um, our y-intercept plus our slope times our predicted x, or the x value that we find. Um, so which of the following cannot be answered? Um, so for A, it says predict the value of y to a particular value of x. We can do that because all you have to do is plug whatever the value of x is in and then you can find the predicted y. So we can do that. Um, B, estimate the slope between y and x. Yep, because that's all that is is our B subscript one. So we can do that. Um, C, estimate whether the linear association is positive or negative. We can do that because it just depends on the sign of our slope. So we can do that. So D is the only one that we can't do. Estimate whether the association is linear or nonlinear. You can't tell that, you know, because obviously the regression equation is going to be linear, but we don't know whether the association of our actual data is linear or nonlinear. So that's why you cannot figure it out with that. Um, so does that make sense to everybody why it's D? Nope. All right, I'll assume that we are all okay. All right, mm -mm -mm. and if I move on and you were like typing and you're like, whoa, just please let me know and we're we'll definitely go over something. All right, so regression between foot length, response variable in centimeters, and height explanatory variable in inches for 33 students resulted in the following regression equation. Y equals, <coughs> excuse me, 10.9 plus 0.23x. One student in the sample was 73 inches tall with a foot length of 29 centimeters. What is the predicted foot length for this student? Interesting stuff, compelling. Um, so, all right, go ahead and try this one out. Let me try this poll thing again. Relaunch poll one. Okay, boom. All right, try this one out and we will go over it together.
Okay, whoa. I'm struggling. Oh my goodness. Ah. All right, let me end this poll. Okay, ha, ah, hello. All right, so let's go over this one. How do I? <laughs> I'm not using this poll thing anymore. I don't like it. I was all excited for tonight to use it, and now I'm sad. Okay. Okay, yeah, let's do this. Okay, so in this case, um, so we have a regression equation, whatever. Um, and this is trying to figure out basically you have to solve this one out. So if we go ahead and use this regression equation that we have here, we're going to have y because we're trying to find the predicted foot length, which is our y, um, as it says, uh, foot length. So this is our response variable, which is y. So then y equals 10.9 because that is our, um, like it says right here, our y intercept, and then plus 0 0.23, and then we just do it uh, multiplied by x. And x is our 73. That's going to be our explanatory variable, so 73 inches. Um, that's where we get that. So explanatory variable again. And then if you solve this out, you end up getting y equals 27.69. So our answer is b. So just had to solve that one out. That's all. All righty. All right. In the simple linear regression equation, y equals b subscript 0 plus but b subscript one x, the symbol of x represents what? So go ahead and type your answers in the chat box because I'm done with that polling thing. Yes, Mary, that is how I feel too. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's see who's right. Probably. Okay. So remember, our, um, remember, like I just said in the last one, y is going to be our um, response variable because that's what we're trying to, that's what we're predicting. So that's why it can't be A because we're not. We're looking for x. X is going to be the one that's independent. Like y is dependent on everything in this equation. It's going to change dependent on this part of the equation. So it can't be a. Um, b isn't correct because so technically, so let, let me write. So this is why our estimated intercept is going to be um, b subscript zero. Our slope is the b subscript one, and explanatory variable is x. So just remember that explanatory x. Nice bubble. X right there. So that's why our answer is D because these are the rest of the um, parts of the equation. Does that make sense why it's D? Yeah, don't second guess yourself, Laura. Come on now. <laughs> Everyone got that though. Okay, no Yelps for help. All right. All right, one more. So the IQR gives a range of the middle what percent of the data? So going back to some box plots. So guys, go ahead and try this one out and we will review it. No question marks. Who put a question mark? P hat. How do I? <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> or is it one, one, like, hat? Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me, let me draw this one out. All right. Boop. Um, okay. Yes. Here we go. So IQR, remember, if we draw this box plot, I love box plots. Let me just tell you guys. I'm going to get a tattoo of a box plot and the empirical rule. That's, that's just, it's gone down. I love them. They're so much fun. So box plot, boom. So remember the IQR, yes, correct. P-hap. 
I don't I, I don't know. I don't I don't want to say your name wrong. Okay, Q1, oop, and Q3. So this is gonna be our IQR. So this middle part. So remember, every part of this of our um box plot is 25%. So 25, 25, 25, 25, because obviously together we're gonna get a hundo. 100 emoji, laughing emoji. Okay, so here, that's why, so we're looking for what percent of the data is the IQR. So all you have, to, it's between Q1 and Q3. So obviously we just have to add up these and you end up getting that this is 50% of the data because then plus obviously the 25 and the 25 will give you 100. I should have put it in red. Um, so the answer is B. So yeah, good job guys. All right, everyone's least favorite part of the night when the review is over. I'll give you tissues if you need to, if you're crying. So check out the other reviews online um, on the YouTube channel, because that's exciting. Um, uh, next group review will be on Thursday. Next Thursday we'll have it. Actually, Lydia also has a group review on um, Sunday, so go ahead and check in with hers if you want um, some more practice. Um, and if you haven't given me your Penn State email in the chat box, thank you, Karen. <laughs> if you could just go ahead and put that in for me. Um, if you guys have any last minute questions, let me know. If not, you guys are good to go for tonight.